Ja. How are you doing? I'm okay. Just uh, got back from another leg of moving. So that was fun. Appreciate you doing this in the <laughs> in the midst of all that. That's fine. Yeah. No, it's just as you had predicted that like, well, how it always goes, right? Where it's like when right. you have time of moving, then it all, you just put it off to the very end. Classic. Yeah. Oh. So uh, I don't think we can live stream to Facebook while also having these automatic captions on. Okay. So I'm just gonna save, I'm gonna save a recording of the meeting and then upload it to our Facebook afterwards. Okay. We'll wait for more people to join. <laughs> We'll give it a few more minutes for more people to, to join in. But it's just gonna be the two two panelists. Um, Diana had to drop out, but I think it'll still be an interesting discussion regardless.
All right, well, now it's 2.10, and I um, figure we should just get started. Uh, it looks like it's a pretty small group, so maybe we can have more of an informal discussion than like a formal uh, question and answer kind of thing. Um, Marlon or Allison, either of you want to go first, or should I? Makes no difference to me. Marlon, do you have any preference? If you're talking, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't care. Uh, you can go first. All right, I'll go first. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Allison. I she her pronouns. Um, and I do work in the realm of like privacy and anti surveillance. I run a small organization called Library Freedom Project, where I organize librarians as like a political block against surveillance. But like broadly speaking, you know, like we spend a lot of time thinking about technology and power and building power and how like technology can be helpful to us, but also like recognizing um, who uh, like who benefits from like technology and how the um, ownership and access to it is centralized and like who the kind of big players are and all that sort of stuff. So that's what my day job is. So I spend a lot of time thinking about the future and the present and like futuristic stuff um, and how we can um, how we can be organized, how we can like use tech for purposes that benefit us um, while also recognizing um, how basically some of the most powerful forces that exist in the world right now are technology companies. I mean, if you look at the top 10 companies in the world by market capitalization, I think seven of them are tech companies. And like, I use that loosely, right? Because like Amazon is not a tech company, you know, Amazon is an everything company. Um, they're a logistics empire, they're a shipping company. They run um, Amazon Web Services, which is the you know, essentially it's the backbone of the internet. It's like 40 or 60% of all servers are running on Amazon's um, infrastructure, including the CIA and Netflix. Um, so like recognizing how much power is contained in these entities and how we use them for everything now, like our entire communication, um, our social networks. And I don't mean social network in the sense of Facebook. I mean like who we speak to and when and how long, all of our organizing, um, and you know how this matters not just from the power differential, but because of what this has to do with the business model of these companies. You know they make money on data, and it's we're giving them all this data. So I also work on um, free software, like free and open source software. So you know the the best set of alternatives that we have for technology that's actually under something that looks like worker control. I mean, it's the politics of it are a little bit weird sometimes because not everybody comes into it as a political choice. You know, some people just like to tinker with things and they don't like big companies telling them that they can't. But, um, you know, I, I come at it as a socialist and I think that, you know, free and open source software is one small way that we can, um, you know, we can sort of cooperatize technology. So that is, that's the perspective that I'm coming to this conversation with. Um, before COVID, what I was mainly fake focusing on, um, there were a number of things, but I think the, the, the area of all this that had some of my attention the most was um, broadly speaking, the realm of artificial intelligence and its use in different kinds of surveillance and predictive technologies and what the relationship is between those things and like labor and um, systems of control like policing and that sort of thing. And so a specific example of this would be something like facial recognition. Um, you know, it's becoming more ubiquitous. You can, it's, it's a means of recognizing 
anybody in a crowd from a still image or a moving, you know, real real time image, um, and how easy it was becoming for police departments to gain access to this technology. How all those big tech companies that I mentioned, um, they're the ones who are building these infrastructures. So Amazon has one of the the biggest products, and they sell it to law enforcement, and they like have because of how much money and power is involved in this, like they can very easily get it um, into different communities. Another thing I was spending a lot of time thinking about was um, consumer technologies for surveillance, like another Amazon product, Amazon Ring, which is a doorbell that is connected to the internet that has a camera and a microphone on it. And your, you know, it, it completely changes our, um, relationship to public space when there are cameras on everything. Um, it's a, there's all these relationships between like, you know, gentrification and like bourgeoisification of neighborhoods, like neighborhoods like Fishtown and Kensington have tons of these doorbells. And the way that um, people who want to install them engage with their neighborhoods versus who's on the other side of the camera. And so just thinking about all these different um, new technologies that are in the world and how they impact us um, as just like human beings and community members and in, in specific how they impact us as socialists and how they are changing our capacity to organize. Because if facial recognition exists all over the place in public, um, not everybody we want to come to the, to the direct action is coming. If, you know, consumer technologies are on everybody's front door, there is there, it changes the, the relationship between neighbors in public space and also like the people who are being surveilled tend to be um, members of the working class and poor. Um, so, so those were the main things I was focusing on before COVID and now that we live in Roni's world, um, I am still thinking about those things and thinking about how they are gonna be even further weaponized for um, the current moment. And, and just like as before, you know, these technologies are not really about, they're not actually about safety or now they're not actually about public health. They're about control, um, social control. And so, you know, something like facial recognition, for example, there's already a big conversation in the private sector about trying to use facial recognition or similar artificial intelligence to detect signs of illness. I mean, this is, it's absolutely snake oil, but the point is it can identify a person and make a decision about a person based on a set of criteria. And it should be troublesome to all of us because we know exactly who is going to be targeted by these technologies. You know, um, the other thing that I'm thinking about is labor and surveillance particularly how given what the environment is like um, for employment, um, you know, how many people are now unemployed and the jobs that are, are left or that are gonna be left are basically gonna be working for either the gig economy, which is all like Silicon Valley tech world or working in Amazon warehouses. And what's true about both of these different um, workplaces is that um, organizing in them is exceedingly difficult for a number of reasons, probably reasons that a lot of folks on this call may be already familiar with. You know, people are not actually employees, they're independent contractors. The liability is shifted onto the worker instead of onto the company. Um, and the workers are under a tremendous amount of surveillance all day, every day. So in Amazon warehouses, they are timed for tasks. This is why you hear things like they don't have bathroom breaks, they have to pee in bottles and that sort of thing. Um, their movements are tracked. Um, their proximity to other workers is tracked if they spend too much time in certain areas of the warehouse. Um, Amazon has a, um, they fire people for not meeting productivity rates and they have such a high turnover for this for the productivity rates, it's something like 20% in all their warehouses. So in other words, every year, 20% of the workforce turns over just for not meeting these goals. Um, and this is significant, not just from an, from an organizing perspective, because it's super hard to have any conversation with, your, with other workers in these warehouses when you're under that kind of scrutiny. Um, 
but um, we've seen these capabilities used specifically to target um, labor organizers in these places. So um, there was just a piece that came out about how um, Amazon is doing these heat maps for union organizing. Maybe folks have seen this. Um, and they're using um, all these different data points that will tell them if that place is likely to start unionizing. And like, it's so cynical. I mean, one of the points is OSHA violations. So if you're reporting OSHA violations in your Amazon warehouse, they're going to they're gonna flag you as potentially starting to, to get organized and they're going to uh, um, show you more scrutiny. And like considering how many OSHA violations there are now under Roni, um, I mean, this is a, this is an extraordinary level of of control. And the, so the other thing about um, the Amazon model is that I shouldn't call it the Amazon model because it actually came from trucking. Like truckers were the the kind of vanguard of this as the new means of um, surveilling and exploiting labor. You know, same thing with independent contractors, owner operators. People probably heard of this sort of thing. Shifting liability and pushing them to. Um, to meet um, productivity demands faster and also being surveilled, retina scans to see if they're awake and all that sort of stuff. Um, so then Amazon adopted this model and th this is the future of work. Um, Uber already does a lot of things like this. Um, different other gig kinds of gig work do this. And so I'm, I'm gonna stop talking in a second because I wanna hear from Marlon and I wanna get people's questions, but th the basics of it are that I'm thinking about what our future is as socialists when basically what we're what we're looking at now is is a real kind of showdown with these forces of capital with the big big players and I think Amazon is um, pretty much the main one because of um, just the many different ways that it interacts with our lives and how many of us are going to have to go and work in these places and you know i'm just thinking about the implications there are opportunities in this if anybody's read um kim moody's excellent book on new terrain where he talks about how the newest frontier forgive the colonial language i don't know a better word than frontier of um of labor is going to be logistics centers you know shipping and warehouses and like ports and all that sort of stuff and how it presents a lot of unique challenges because of the, the level of precarity that labor um, experiences at those places, but also a lot of new opportunities. Because the thing is, if you shut one of those down, you shut the whole world down. And that's part of what we're seeing now with all these Amazon wildcat strikes. Um, so I think it's very frightening and something that we should be conversant in and understand what it means for us and, and how we're trying to um, keep ourselves organized. And then, but also, be excited about it because it's exciting. So thank you. Thanks for that, Allison. That was really that was really interesting. Um, yeah, uh, Marlon, you uh, ready? Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, that was really interesting, Allison. Thanks. Like especially because I, so I, I I'll introduce myself. Hi, I'm Marlon, uh, and I come at this from a perspective of like a science fiction writer. So my sort of inspiration from like, you know, socialism and socialist ideas is kind of through the, the sense of like world building. So like, I think this is a really interesting panel because it seems like Allison, you're sort of um, informed by like, you know, what are the, what's the work that needs to be done to fight against sort of the, the current capitalist like superstructure or whatever. And sort of my, where I'm coming at it from is like, what would the world look like sort of after the struggle is theoretically won or lost or like, you know, something happens such that like things change from where they are and then what, what happens in the future, right? So um, like I've written one novel and I'll actually post a, um, a link to the novel's website if you wanna look at it in the chat, you know. Uh, let me just, well, I'll do that in a minute so I don't lose my, uh, you know, but basically sort of as, as a, um, where I come at it from, so, uh, yeah. So socialism in my future fiction is sort of an attempt to envision answers to like 
the common question that people will ask you as like, you know, when you're trying to stop the gears of the capitalist system and like create a new one, they'll be like, well, that's very great, but how is like work actually gonna get done? What is it actually gonna look like? I think sort of like people's inability to like envision sort of a future without the sort of exploitative relationships sort of driving the economic relationships that we have is sort of one of the reasons why people have a difficult time getting invested or involved in like this whole movement. So, you know, that's like, that's how I came to the left in general is sort of like imagining, well, okay, we know that this sort of exploitative system in which people are only working because they're worried about like not being able to survive is bad. So what's, what are some other ways to do this? Um, anyway, uh, so in sort of a book, so I wrote one novel that is, um, let me just find this uh, thing. It sort of was centered around a world in which um, like climate collapse was inevitable. And then as a result, like, a centrally planned but kind of like corporate run government was set up to um, like stop the like as to stop this sort of like inevitable climate collapse from finally like destroying even their models of being I guess and so this was called uh, the meld and it was largely based on like, you know, what would happen, how, how, what would be like the, like, you know, interesting you talk about Amazon, what would be the ideal, like, you know, sort of world in which like, you know, if Amazon were like basically just in charge of how the economy and like people's relationships were run. And so what I came to was, so the MELD is a centrally planned artificial intelligence facilitated fully robot automated economy where people are kept drugged through airborne chemicals and work is in the form of simulation or logic games of all sorts that everyone is required uh, to play. And then successes are taken up, analyzed by like artificial intelligence and corresponded to like ever increasing changes in like sort of economic, industrial and social processes. So like very inspired by this sort of concept of like well if you turn work into games then people will want to play it but it's sort of very like I've always found that to be sort of a very dystopian model because essentially that's kind of it's, it seems like that's sort of how they're trying how um the sort of the capitalist frontier if you will, will be is all about like increasing efficiency and not really thinking of this in terms of like what our yeah, what's human, but what's like, you know, most efficient. And it seemed nothing more like, you know, games essentially, like turning people's livelihoods into like games to be made efficient. Um, then, uh, so, but anyway, in this sort of like meld dystopia, there's no money and life is communal, but um, everybody is sort of kept at like a bare minimum, like rationed survival. And so these drugs reduced appetite and lifespan such that like people were wasting away very quickly, uh, like in the like just after the prime of their life, but everyone was fine with it. And of course, then the justification is that like, well, this is required because otherwise ca climate change is going to wipe out humanity. And so in the book, kind of like the, um, the central conflict was uh, between this sort of meld government and the poorer neighborhoods where it hadn't yet expanded into. And so the, the sort of gamed out scenario plan was to try to deny resources to these poorer neighborhoods so then they would eventually welcome this like sort of bare minimum resource, you know, struggle free existence within the meld. But then to counter this, because people who were living in these poor neighborhoods were like freaked out at the concept of just sort of essentially yeah just this whole concept they formed economies like of their own uh kind of like syndicalist anarchist co economies with like you know based on salvaging scrap gardening from vacant lots smuggling resources from other areas 
and all sort of based on the concept of like labor hours. So like, you know, one hour of labor is equivalent to one hour dollar. And then this would be accounted on like local levels and subject to brutal retaliation from like local governing councils. Um, so that, that this like sort of went in my engagement with like, you know, oh, what would like a world, you know, taking these sort of um, trends that we see that you sort of talked about a lot, Allison, in your uh, speech, what would a world look like if these trends were just like continued and followed through to the point of like actual crisis, which is like the only point that sort of capitalists really understand where it's like, oh my God, you look outside your window and everything is, I mean, they're already doing this, right? But how do we maintain control within this? And then what would happen afterwards? And that kind of, for me anyway, um, was a big part of my journey as like, you know, under like becoming more of a leftist. Um, since that, so that's sort of, that was sort of just the general like, what do you call it? Work of um, uh, th that book that I wrote. And uh, here, I'm gonna post a link to it in the chat. So if people want to read more about it, they can look at the website for it. Because I didn't really prepare super a lot for this. There we go. So that is what is called, it's called the Garden Punk. Uh, it was gonna be a series, but it's sort of just, that's the idea of behind the book. And then um, more recently, I wrote a book that was intended to be a little bit more of a serious, like examination into like, what would the, what would the world look like if we as socialists were to actually seize control of the the means of production as in like you know which is largely again based on this vision of the world that amazon's trying to create which is like you know logistics hubs and um like you know taking control of just like the system of uh moving moving resources to where they need to go what if that was in in control of the people and inspired by a concept of like all of people's necessities and like you know not just necessities to survive but to survive with some level of dignity were like ensured and that was like the main goal behind like what what this what what like the system that we created would look like and i wanted to do that just because i felt like there's a lot of sort of doom and gloom about sort of like the future and so what would what would a good future look like right what would this a future where we we one look like um and so you know in effect this is kind of like a combination of the two systems that i uh described in the my about my first book so everything for survival with dignity is free but people also get paid at a work rate at paid at for all work equally at a rate of like one currency hour per hour of work and then currency is used on items for which mass scaling like to enable free distribution for all is neither possible nor desirable. The price of these items equals a per unit cost of hourly work. It's like there's a whole like, you know, I went like math geek down a rabbit hole of this. And then like work itself is largely local and communal, sort of creating social incentives rather than like, you know, sort of uh, exploitative survival based incentives to get the work done. Logistics resource flows like scaling larger than just like the immediate sort of community hub distribution center level are automated wherever possible because it's a lot more difficult to be personally invested in something that's like a bigger level than sort of your immediate neighborhood or your immediate community. Um, and so like this is meant to be like a transitional system focused on gradual technological development um, sort of run by like, you know, the people uh, to, gradually reduce the size of like, you know, the market based economy. So these are the parts of the economy that are not freely available to everyone until all things are communal and free, sort of ideally like full communism. Um, so, you know, that that's sort of, uh, but then of course, like you have to think about what does that also like, you know, so that's like all well and good, but that's not gonna solve all the problems, you know, regarding 
like, you know, all the like, various social problems and social inequities that are behind that. So then what's still there? What will you have to look forward to? So I don't know. I mean, like I'll, I think I'm rambling a little bit, but the point being that as a, as a science fiction writer, I'm just really interested in, um, you know, socialist visions of the future. Like, you know, that, so that's, that's why I'm on the panel. And um, yeah, you know, I encourage anyone who's like interested in socialist future fiction. Oh, and, and basically because to me, socialist future fiction is a lot more accessible than like socialist theory as far as like sort of allowing people to have visions of the future under like what we're sort of saying. I think that, you know, I think that's really important as organizers that we try to have some sense of being visionaries too, because people, um, that's what inspires people, right? People want, don't want to just know like, you know, the nuts and bolts. People want to know well, what's it going to look like? What are my relationships with my neighbors, my family, my friends going to look like? You know, how's my day, like how would my day look under like communism versus like this capitalist system that we have now and what would be better about it? And how can you, sh how can you show that? And I think that, um, fiction, like, you know, fiction that, like, involves creating a whole world is, like, a little bit more effective than just, you know, spouting theory at people. Um, you know, it's sort of, like, fiction inspired by theory, and so that's sort of my, my sense as, like, you know, an, of infusing vision into organizing. Anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's my spiel, um, you know, yeah. Thanks, Marlon. That was interesting. Um, so I think now for the rest of the time here, I think we can just open up to questions that anyone has for the panelists or for anyone on this call, or just like if any of the things that were said, like brought up some ideas that you've been thinking about, you know, I'd love to hear them. This doesn't need to be like a formal Q and A, just more like a general discussion. So um, yeah, feel free to chime in if you have any thoughts? Um, and if it, if it gets, I think we can just, un, just unmute yourself and say something. I mean, because there's only nine people on this call, so I don't think we need to worry about like raising hands or whatever, but yeah. I mean, I just kind of want to like wrap with Marlon about this a little bit since we're like thinking about very similar things, unless people have questions, but I, as an extrovert, I am compelled to talk. Um, so I, I just, I'm, I'm so glad that you're doing the writing that you're doing. I think speculative fiction is super important. Um, like you said, like we need a positive, we need a vision of the future, we need to have a positive vision. We need to see what winning looks like. We need to, it to be realistic and based in, um, what we know about the present and the past. I mean, I think it's no coincidence that a lot of science fiction writers have been socialists and anarchists um, and they also uh, study history, you know, like I, people talk about Octavia Butler, like nailing this time so much. And they're like, how did she do it? She was a history scholar. That's how yeah. she did it. Right. Um, so I just wanted to say that. And also like, I think that, yeah, I feel like our work, it's like situated on the same, um, trajectory is the wrong word, but like I'm like, I'm thinking about the way that technology is used in the present because I want to be ready for what comes and like thinking about what you were talking about in your novel, like, you know, I, I feel like I, I hear a lot of leftists like flippantly talk about like, I mean, I hope we're sort of past like talking about fully automated luxury communism now because like there's not actually a real future where we see that. Um, yeah. But like, even as like a sort of flip comment, um, you know, or people will flippantly be like, we just have to nationalize Amazon. And it's like, well, right. Yeah. yeah. But uh, how do we reconcile all the parts of it that are bad? Like the supply chain question is one that I right. think about a lot. Yeah, me too. Like, how do we have an anti-imperialist supply chain? Like, let's say we win, right? And we like go, we storm Amazon and we take over. Um, how do we get the stuff? Right. 
yeah, no, I mean, that's like, you know, and, and is it, is the sort of organizing presently solution to like, try to build something on our own? Or is it like, you know, sort of, do we sort of acknowledge like, because the problems with that are like, you know, economies of scale make it like, make that feel like, you know, really difficult. But then at the same time, the economies of scale that are existing, how much of them are um, like, irrevocably evil, you know, and how like, you know, how much of them can like, are, you know, sort of just like, fundamentally based in like, you know, practices that as socialists, we wouldn't condone. And so then, you know, you get to the question of like, yeah, you know, how, how do we, how much are we supposed to be like prefiguring the world we want to see versus how much are we supposed to be like fighting against the powers that be to seize what they've already created. I think about that a lot as sort of like, you know, trying to figure out like my, like priorities as like organizers, you know, like for like sort of like the ideal priorities as organizers is sort of like, you know, that, that question. Totally. And it feels super hard, like, not just because of all the things you said, like, I feel like this is, it sort of comes out on the like, um, anarchist v communist spectrum a little bit too, because like, like, uh, I want it to, I want to just seize the, the means and then take over their centrally planned economy, which is what Amazon is, you know, there's a great book, maybe some folks have read called the People's Republic of Walmart. It mm -hmm. talks about this. Like these, these like, the, the it's like, it seems sort of obvious when you start thinking about it, but like, of course the capitalists don't let a market run their business. It would be chaos. Yeah. It would be, <laughs> it would be like yeah. Yeah. total uncertainty. Do you know this story, Marlon, of a, of a, there is a company that tried to go from a centrally planned internal economy to a marketplace. Do you know this story? No, I don't. Cheers. It's Sears, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jake knows it. It's Sears, and they failed. They had different parts of the company like competing with each other, yeah. And it was super inefficient, and like, right. I mean, all the things that we know about how markets work, but mm -hmm. yeah, it was like I mean, a super libertarian dude was like, no, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> okay. Right. We're, we're seeing that kind of happen in terms of like the states competing with the federal government for like ventilators and masks and stuff it's just like the idea of competition being the like this like ideal ethos to aspire to is just ridiculous because it's like there are winners and losers if there's competition and right. if you're talking about like the economy or society then losers means people like dying which is right i mean yeah which is ridiculous but Right. So like, but to, to meet the needs of, you know, the world's population, uh, we need economies of scale and all the ones that we have now are infinitely complex and exploitative at every, at every point along that, like I was reading this thing about, um, I got really into, I love supply chains. I love shipping. I love any like logistics thing. I'm like, Ooh, tell me about where it happens far away, you know? And I got really into, um, looking into like, all, you know, all these big companies are like, we're going to like green our entire, like Amazon was like, we're going to get to a hundred percent renewable energy and blah, 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 blah. Well, first of all, most of them are buying carbon credits, which is like selling indulgences, you know? And it's bullshit. But then the other thing is, if they're actually trying to like green their whole, all their processes, they can't do it because their supply chains are so vast and complex. Um, who was it? Intel tried to source its supplier chain. Um, it took them four years to identify all 16,000 points along the supply chain. So how the fuck, like, and the thing is the People's Republic of Walmart didn't really talk about that. It was like, these are centrally planned economies. And I'm like, okay, how do we take them? And then what do we do when do we take them? Cause they seem bad. Certainly a, the, the question it seems, yeah. uh, definitely one that's been, that's plagued socialists and communists for ever. How do we take them? But right. I, I do think it is, 
one way that I, I've heard and, and Amazon kind of, a, this kind of applies to Amazon, but applies to a lot of different like interconnected systems that we have now, like the platforms, you know, and I think I think the plat platforms as the like, as the system by which just the general idea of like what a platform is like Amazon, the website, you go on it, you can access these things and it connects you as the sort of infrastructure for the future, you know, as the infrastructure by which we're going to connect the whole world, because I mean, the whole world is connected, right? But it's the question is, how do we do that in a way that's not, that isn't exploitative, that like takes into account, you know, things like there shouldn't be child mines, like children mining cobalt in Africa, you know, but those things exist as long as they can be like shuffled around within the giant supply chain that is capitalism. Um, and yeah, I don't think anyone's got the answer right now, but. Uh, yeah. No, but it's fun to think about. I mean, another thing that I think is really fascinates me about technology is that the closest thing that we've ever had in the US to socialism, I think, is military Keynesianism. And that was like ARPA and like the NSF and the Department of Defense, like every piece of technology, every component of your phone, every one of the big platforms was like the basic R&D that went into making the thing, the lithium ion battery, capacitive touch screen, all of these were created by, um, public funds. Now it was the military, but like the DOD is the biggest employer in the U S you know, and part of the reason why they were able to do these like blue sky, like exciting research projects was because they have so much money and they were, that was their mandate. It was like, figure out whatever the fuck you want to figure out, like answer some interesting math questions. Um, and, you know, like, because, like, the problems with this model are, like, imperialism, obviously, that they were like, we want to just beat the Soviets at creating the internet. There were almost two internets, which would have been bad, but also interesting. Um, we want to beat them. So, like, we're going to pour all this money into this. And then also, they were like, we're just going to give it away for free to all these capitalists who then are going to figure out ways to monopolize it and, like, get patents on parts of it that was created in the public interest. But I think to me, there's a lot of interesting implications for us as socialists, because presumably the, if we win, we want more of that kind of thing. And the model, the best model we have for making good technology is the military. So we got to take over that system. I mean, and, and still to this day, I mean, I, I the, most of it happened, most of it started in like, you know, Cold War, that's when ARPA got started. Um, but like DARPA still does a huge amount of tech investment, um, and building and, and R and D stuff. Um, the army research lab, the Navy research lab, like this is where most of it. And a lot of these, um, entities fund like free software projects and it's problematic to have that relationship, but also it's like, where else are you going to get money from? And it's public money. So how do we... We want to take that too. Yeah, no, that's like th making me think too. So like my next, I th like, I mean, I'm always like thinking about new projects. So one of my next projects I think is going to be um, <clears throat> inspired by like sort of the, the new, like sort of like the coming in my mind anyway, like space race or specifically like based on like asteroid mining. Right. And so like a lot of like new space, technologies I think are like in that phase of like companies are looking at them but they're like oh we need the government to fund some of the research before we start going into this space and so like what for instance what would happen what's going to happen when like you know I don't know I'm, I'm just imagining like sort of uh, a strike of like sort of uh, hospitality workers at um, like you know some some like you know basically like corporate housing facility outside of the asteroid belt where people are mining for uh for asteroids that's like like sort but like sort of like tying in concepts of like you know publicly funded research and like you know sort of corporate because i mean that's really what 
what hat seems like, you know, like you're saying has actually jump started a lot of like, you know, the sort of next level like future things has like it has to be um public funds because corporations are not they're just not forward thinking. They're like, okay, what's gonna make money like our shareholders money in the next quarter? That's all we can really spend money on. And so it's like, you know, that's how, you know, we're in like a climate crisis that we're in because like there is literally no incentive for, you know, corporate, like corporations to spend the money that they have on this sort of thing. So like, you know, that's a really good point. Um, I guess <clears throat> what, what's, I, I had a, a thought or a question, um, you know, the, Yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah, I, just, I, I do just keep coming back to, like, you know, this sort of, uh, the, the question of, like, the which came first, the chicken or the egg, which came first, um, the creation of new, like, public models or the seizing of existing public, mo like, public monies and public models. Like, you know, as organizers, um, I think, honestly, like, as organizers, we find that we do both, right? Because there's a lot of, like, desire to do both like there's desire from people to like you know kind of people who are slightly more anarchist inclined to like create new models to like oh i feel like i'm sort of building something and that's you kind of see that for instance in our like mutual aid project where it's like let's create this sort of model of like logistics hubs at the time like sort of like logistics hubs and like supply chains um at a time when like you know money is flowing um, I, th I, I sort of think of this as like disaster communism, right? So we're in the midst of a disaster. Um, I thought of it like, cause I, I did some like help w after like Hurricane Harvey and then uh, the hurricane down in um, uh, North Carolina. And what's that? Flor yeah, Hurricane Florence. And um, I found that sort of at those times, like society seemed to like shift a little bit more to like, this sense of like, oh, we're all in this together, like, you know, like whatever, like sort of like the things to prefigure existing or prefigure like a communist model, it became more possible during these times. And so I think that like the time of coronavirus, it sort of presents a unique opportunity um, for like right now for like that prefiguring. Um, so like, so then you see like a lot of people who are interested in like, well, you know, I don't know, like, it seems very difficult to like seize means of production right now. So let's, let's build something. Um, but then on the other hand, I think that, uh, you know, once af after, like once sort of like that, like the, the, um, the, the, the emergency starts to like go away and then like, you know, it's like okay, back to business as usual. Then, then it's then it feels like you know, by creating the, the like sort of expectations of like, well, you know, we're gonna we we deserve to get the things that we need for free. That that creates sort of a a, a, a surgence of like, no, like we're we're not gonna go back to the way things are. Um, and so those are just like my thoughts on like, you know, sort of how the time we're in sort of uh, affects what people, like where people are willing to like, like where, what's most effective as far as like, you know, um, organizing and fighting for what's, what, you know, fighting for the good future. Um, I think, uh, first of all, thank you both. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, second of all, um, I think maybe one of the reasons that, or it, it, it occurs to me that maybe one of the reasons that people during these disasters, I guess, are, um, you know, it, they, in a more of a position to start to, um, you know, create some of these new models is partially because of the, the that sort of imaginative, uh, like, impulse is exercised because it has to be. Um, because like you said, people's like daily, the, the business as usual gets disrupted and um, which makes it easier. It kind of opens up uh, all of these possibilities that have to be considered. 
Um, and I think it's interesting that you keep, you're, you, you've mentioned a couple of times this in Marlon, this, um, this kind of dichotomy between, you know, or I guess this sort of dual um, kind of arms of, of organizing where there's this kind of desire to create new forms and also to fight existing forms. Um, and I just think that it has to be both. I agree with you that it has to be both because um, uh, you, you know, yes, you have to fight against these things, but you also, um, like you said, you ha we have to act as visionaries and, and help people to um, imagine what is possible. Um, personally, I see capitalism as the, uh, uh, like a great inhibitor of possibility. It's like the, the enemy of possibility. It, um, because resources are, you know, you have to contend with this like vice grip constantly. These resources are doled out so inappropriately and so disproportionately that um, I always kind of have this thought, like if we, if we didn't have capitalism to contend with, like all these things would be possible. Can you imagine all of these possible things? Um, but I think that uh, in my experience, at least it's very hard um, for people, uh, they're most, most people have had their imaginations kind of squashed um, by, by just having to survive. So, um, so I think it's important that we do both. Um, yeah, that's it. I, um, I actually also did Harvey Relief. So I'm, fr I'm from here, but I lived in Houston for a short mm -hmm. time, the things you do for love. Um, and I had a lot of the same feelings, like, you know, in terms of the, the mutual aid work we're doing, we like where we were gutting people's houses and all the whole thing. Um, and I got to say, um, I, one thing I learned from that time is do not underestimate people's ability to go swiftly back to normal. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? <clears throat> Um, and, th and that's one thing I really, I'm, I really worry about with this time because I think that the like mutual aid work is extremely important and we're talking about like people's lives. And yet I think I've, I have yet to see an effort like that, that results in, um, something that sustains into the future. Um, mm -hmm. right. maybe with like, I know a lot of people who are involved with like Occupy Sandy that like stuck around through that, but like it, it diminished, it was a huge group and it turned into something quite small, you know? So it's challenging. And, um, I don't know what the answer is to it because like, I think probably the work is exhausting and people are like, I just need a break. And then they take a long break or whatever, or that, um, as you said, Francesca, like capitalism limits the imagination and people are like, well, this is as far as I could imagine what we do together, you know? Um, you know, I think that like, I, I come back to like actual like unions all the time because it seems like that's the thing that we can build into the future and works pretty, you know, reliably to keep people organized around something. And the thing is like, there's a lot of that activity happening in and through all these other projects. Like there's many, many different irons in the fire. And so I think maybe some right. of it is just, what do we expect to happen from them? Um, Something that you brought up before that made me that made me think about a, a research topic that I'm interested in. So the thing about space. So I wonder if you know, like, so I don't know a ton about space research or like things that are happening with it now, except that I do, I have some understanding. I have some friends that work at NASA and they're like, yeah, NASA doesn't get the money that it needs to get. Like no one gives a shit about NASA anymore. And I have been to NASA both in Houston and in Florida and what was extraordinary to me in visiting their facilities is how entire space has been taken over by private space exploration from SpaceX to Boeing to yeah. whatever. And I understand that they don't even pay to use the space. Mm -hmm. And I just like, I has somebody written a book about this or is there somebody researching that or writing about this? Like I'm interested in it because yeah, like you, the usual trajectory is like the capitalists are like, yeah, keep it, keep it going with the public research and we're going to take it. Um, and now, like, it seems like maybe even the, the public research that needs to happen for the task ahead of them for like getting into space and building colonies or whatever the hell is not even there. The funding isn't there. It's just the capitalists. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're right. And it's sort of like, you know, it is very limited to like, you know, 
oh, how do we mine an asteroid? Like, you know, wow, that's like, you know, that's, that's the, um, like, I grew up reading, like, space operas, and I loved, like, you know, this sort of, like, vision of, like, you know, how do we, like, you know, live outside of our, our, like, how do, like, just, like, a little bit more visionary, like, you know, how do we explore this great, you know, vast universe and it's sort of like well no like it turns out like you know how do we get iron from an asteroid is kind of like the extent of um you know the the future the future envisioned by like sort of a capitalist mindset um you know and it's yeah it, it is it's miserable <laughs> uh, yeah i think that's definitely like especially when you talk about space like the very such a constraint that capitalism places on it like and it's wild because so many people don't see the constraints you know they don't see it as they like think freedom is like freedom to get their hair cut you know it's not like they don't they don't have a conception of what it means to like not be under the yoke of capitalism um i i think i think taking it back to like what those things that we see in disasters like the solidarity that we see um is I think really important. It's like one of those like mm -hmm. the veneer of regular life is taken away, you know, by force because of this thing that is ostensibly out of out of people's control. When I mean, in reality, there are things that the government or that society could do to mitigate the damage that it doesn't because of capitalism. But I think it definitely reveals that people, you know, when these systems are disrupted or taken away, like real solidarity can come out. Um, and I think it's a weird thing that we're seeing in this current crisis because of the nature of the crisis. You know, it's not like a hurricane where like people need to come together and like share all these things. It's like we're supposed to be individualized and atomized because that's how to prevent the virus from being spread. Um, but I think also it kind of presents a unique uh, opportunity because when things reopen re in, in the coming month or two, they will again have to close when the virus starts, when the outbreak starts out again, because we've reopened too quickly and we haven't done any of the things that we need to do to prevent it from happening again. So it's like, not that this is a dress rehearsal, but it's like, this is the act one of the pandemic. And then we're going to have the intermission and then it's going to be the act two. And so, you know, we can kind of, I think we can try out a lot of things and then try them out again with the hindsight that we'll have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, I, and I think like mutual aid is like an, an important thing and a, something that is very, not limited, but like, yeah, the scope of it uh, so often is like, is limited, I guess, to just like providing those basic needs. But then it's, I mean, I, there is potential for more. I don't know what that is, you know, which is something that I think we, I think, that this is a theme that comes up a lot when you talk about the future, right? Is that no one knows what, like, we know that there needs to be something different or that there needs to be something that solves, you know, X, Y, or Z problem, but we don't know what that is. And it's like, until someone comes up with it, then, and then we all say like, oh, of course that's what it was. Cause that, uh, why wouldn't it be that very obvious thing? But like, you don't know it until someone says it is I think something that, I think about a lot, especially when it comes to like what it means to be connected and what it means to share ideas, because I think the way that we do those, the way that we do that can have an impact on what ideas come out and like how those are enacted. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know, that's something that I, I've been thinking about a lot when, we're, when we talk about the future is like, you know, it's not like we're all going to upload into the cloud and then we'll all be connected and then the perfect ideas will come out of our consciousnesses in that, you know, it's like, whatever, it's not that, but it's like the way in which we interact shapes the ideas that we have. And I think the more, and I think that's where that sort of prefiguration that sort of the more anarchist leaning uh, leftists have, right. Is like, there needs to be some amount of like changing the way in which we interact with the world and with each other in order to actually bring about the society that we want. Um, 
Mm. Yeah, it's kind of like exercising. <laughs> it's like <laughs> exercising that option and seeing what comes out of it, even if it fails, like a project where you're trying to make a new economy, it, it's going to fail because it's under capitalism, but uh, it's still the idea that you're like exercising that, that muscle and seeing what can happen, um, creating new ideas, new possibilities, and also offering new options, like new possible options for people who might not be able to envision it. Um, at least that's what I, I hope is what happens. <laughs> yeah. One of the scenes that I was like proud of in this like new book that I'm writing is um, a, it's, so it, it sort of looks back on like sort of a pre-revolutionary past and one of like the triggers for it, like sort of like the things that led up to this revolutionary sort of fight was a, um, a strike it, uh, by like a, a union of like a Walmart that um, ba essentially amounted to like, we're going to take this storage that the this Walmart has and distribute it to everyone for free following like a disaster that happens. So it's sort of like combining this sort of idea of mutual aid with like sort of a, a militant strike and kind of basically like forcing Walmart to be like, well, this disaster happened. Like, shouldn't you be providing, like, the, you, like you're this richest corporation here. Shouldn't you be providing this? And we're just going to like start doing it and force you to like toe this line between like, you know, um, sort of, oh, we care about, you know, supporting people and like your sort of attachment to like private property and like always making profit on things. So, you know, I thought that was like, you know, I was like, wow, it'd be really cool if something like this were to like actually happen, like, you know, based on an emergency that comes about. So then you have like public support for this thing that for the emergency, like people wouldn't even have like imagined. They would be like, wait, you know, I mean, like sort of you get go to Walmart and just get the stuff that you need for free, like, you know, what the fuck? But then it's like, oh, wait, this is what we need because we're starving out here and nobody's helping us. Anyone who uh, hasn't said anything, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what we've discussed and questions or anything that you have. Hey, this is Jeremy. Um, I was just wondering like, what people think about like what the pandemic will mean in terms of like things like, is it going to increase the pace of like automation and drones and robots and like what that could mean for labor organizing. Yeah, I mean, it's already happening. You know, um, there are uh, police departments around the country that are using drones to yell at um, homeless people um, and tell them to socially distance or whatever. Um, you know, there's all sorts of products that are getting marketed to everybody from private business to law enforcement about um, different kinds of like artificial intelligence based biometric surveillance, fever detection, um, things of that nature, using facial recognition to try to, it's, it's technically it's called affect recognition and it like it's supposed to detect your affect and it's, it's bullshit, but like they're marketing these products. Um, you know, in terms of automation, I can imagine a whole lot more, right? Like how are they going to automate enforcing social distancing or things like that? Um, you know, especially when um, law enforcement are so, they're coming down with COVID at such high rates, like they have powerful unions and they're going to, they're gonna probably not put up with that for too long. And so, but they're not gonna stop being cops. And so like, how are they gonna still be cops? Like it's gonna be tech, it's gonna be RoboCop. <coughs> so I think like it's already happening. <coughs> and I think we can kind of predict what more will come when we imagine what comes next, you know? Yeah, no, I think, and I think too, it sort of presents almost like, you know, a somewhat unique opportunity for like technologists on the left too, because um, like these new automation technologies 
are not going to be great, like, especially at first, like, you know, like, I mean, I guess I'm sort of just remembering, like, so I went to you, like, because I just moved a bunch of stuff uh, from my old house to a new place. And um, I went to the U-Haul. And when I went there, because of, like, the coronavirus, um, it was sort of like, you know, oh, you have to go through, like, our website, and here's a QR code, and you have to do this. And it's sort of like, nothing was working. And so I, I kind of almost see that being, like, the in, at least like in the next, you know, for the next year or so as like companies scramble to like, you know, automate everything, companies and like police forces, there's going to be a lot of like stuff that doesn't work. And so I think that like, you know, it represents a bit of a unique time to be like, you know, like in these moments of transition is when you can like weave through and like sort of, I don't know, create some, some like, at least it's interesting to me, like, you know, what, what, what can be done in these moments? I don't know how lasting it is, or I, like, I, I haven't done enough, like, historical research to, like, get a sense for, like, is this a time when, um, like, sort of automation or, like, sort of technologies for, like, you know, disrupting things, um, can rise to the fore on the left. Um, I don't. I don't really know enough, like, to answer that question. But I think it's certainly like an interesting time to think, like, you know, oh, like the automation technologies will be attempted to come out by capital and the police and sort of all the forces that be, but they're not going to be very good at first. And so, like, you know, how can we kind of Es like estimate the ways in which those automation technologies are not good and, and like take action accordingly. Well, the thing is they're not good now, right? Yeah, like yeah, facial right, recognition, right. for example, um, gets all kinds of false positives of black people. Well, that right. is, a, is a kind of not good that is beneficial to the forces that have power. Um, mm -hmm. And the thing is, we don't actually want some of these technologies to be better. We want them to be not in existence. Exactly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter. that they, I mean, fever detection is absolute snake oil. It, it detect, it's like they, they take the temperature of the outside of your skin. It's not even internal. There are mm -hmm. all sorts of things that can make you have hot skin. And mm -hmm. for that matter, like, it's a, most people who have COVID are asymptomatic, right? So like, there's not even a real thing to be like, oh, well, if you don't have a fever, you're fine. Um, but it doesn't even actually detect if you have a fever. And this is the hot commodity now. Like it's getting implemented in grocery stores all over the place, in Amazon warehouses. Yeah, so it's almost like people are being sold on like the idea of security, but really the only impact of it is just to like, you know, oh, this, this, this gives us cover to just like, you know, be more repressive and more like, you know, sort of implement the kind of world that we want to, to implement, which it, which is essentially like fundamentally what it seems like it is, is just like, how do we coalesce more of the wealth and resources for like, you know, the ruling class and like, in, ever increase like the level of people who are like just living hand to mouth like providing their labor to support this like you know system without like actually being able to survive with any semblance of dignity like you know sort of like use like that's like the main goal and so how do we like use this automation technology to like make it seem like we're doing everything for the sake of people's like safety but it's not actually doing that I mean, and I don't really know how, like, we as leftists sort of, like, combat that um, other than by, like, saying, like, this is what they're doing, don't you see that? And then, like, playing on sort of a sense of, like, increased automation is bad, but that's, like, you know, not really what the ultimate thing is, because, like, automation, like, actual automation that, like, you know, improves public you know, output of like, you know, resources to the public um, is actually probably necessary and good, you know, sort of like, you know, I know like the, the fully automated luxury communism isn't like sort of the, the thing that is, you know, just around the corner if we just seize Amazon, but 
it's sort of like a vision, I guess, to like, you know, work toward where it's like, oh yeah, you can, you don't have to worry about working for the things that you need to survive. Everything should be provided for you. And like that sort of, like there's, automation is almost necessary to create that world, but, and, and sort of that's almost going to be the, the brand that is like sold to you by Amazon, which is like, you know, automation. We live, like, let's live in a world where everything is automatically sent. Oh, but you still have to pay for it. And um, you're still going to be, you're probably not going to get it unless you make a lot of money. Yeah, I think, um, I think, yeah, automation is definitely like something that in a, in a vacuum, automation is good because it means we have to do less as people to get stuff. In capitalism, that means, of course, that it's good for the owners because they have to pay less people to do the work. Um, but in like an ideal society, in a future social society, we would, we would encourage automation. Um, I think also thinking about that kind of, like the methods that uh, different companies and stuff are using, like the fever detection, like the temperature thing, which is, like you pointed out, Allison, kind of ridiculous. I mean, just even just the fact that people's internal temperature varies, like from person to person, is just immediately throws off the whole thing. Like if your if your natural body temperature is ninety nine point four, and they flag that, it's like, what does that mean? Um, so that's something. But I, I think I think, you know, when we, it's like it kind of gets back to the dual power thing, right? Like how as leftists, uh, would we be able to present an alternative. And I think one big barrier to that is that biomedical technology is expensive as hell. It's incredibly expensive and we don't have the resources to like, like it would be really, really great if we as Philly socialists could set up free COVID testing. Like that would mean, that would be a great dual power thing. Unfortunately, it's really expensive to do that, which is, which is a problem, which is a barrier. And I don't know, automation could, potentially lower some barriers to entry for, for like people to do things. But the problem is, yeah, when they're privately owned, like I'm just thinking especially like automation in terms of software, for example, we're using automatically generated captions on this Zoom meeting right now. And it, it's, it's cheaper than paying someone to, to listen and type the thing that is kind of putting, that's that co conflict though with automation taking people's jobs because that means someone who is job it is is to do captioning doesn't get that work it does mean it's more accessible to us as like an organization that's sponsored by fundraising and by membership dues but it's so it's like that trade-off there and um but I, I think i don't know i i would love to see automation be like or the tools of automation to be seized and used for like more in like more technologies or more applications than it would be imagined by capitalism, but don't know exactly what that would be, but yeah. Well, I'm a lot more cynical about it, honestly. I mean, I think that while it is all those things that you both have said about it are true, I think one, one, first of all, like the way that it's showing up in labor right now is, is making it way harder for us to get to the future where we use it for our own sakes, right? Like where, you know, the workforce, the labor force has never been more productive ever at any point in history. And yet we don't reap any of the benefits of that productivity. And like, we're, there's no, that we're not yet at the like, robots are replacing our jobs future. What we are at is robots and, and automated processes um, are, are working to treat us more like robots. And that's how it is in an Amazon warehouse, right? I mean, there are, there are robots that like assist with the picking, but they, they just make the humans have to run faster and harder. And so it's, it's literally getting the, the, the fully automated luxury communist future. One of the reasons that I hate that is because it's like, well, there, I don't know how we get from here to there if we want automation to exist on the other end, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is it is incredibly resource intensive. And I have yet to see anybody talk about how we reconcile that part of it. Um, we cannot, we like the, the current state of like one natural language processor 
uh, the computing power is the same as taking 125 flights from New York to Beijing, right? Um, uh, the thing with artificial intelligence um, is that it is super data intensive. It doesn't work unless you have enormous data sets to train it with. And that is a lot of energy. And most of that, most of those servers are burning coal somewhere, usually like in China, you know, maybe somewhere else, right? There might be, you might get lucky and have like a little bit more um, sustainable energy source, but at the scale, uh, it's just not possible. And it's like what we said about like all these big companies being like, oh, we're gonna green our processes, but they're just buying carbon credits. So they're, they're burning carbon and then buying some like wind power or something to offset it. But like, we know that it doesn't offset it because we're already way past the point that we need to be at. Um, and so, you know, the thing is like to get to the level of efficiency, there's a, there's a concept, um, called the rebound effects and efficiency to get to the level of efficiency that we're talking about where we wouldn't have to work anymore or where like automation would make work easier or something like we have to get to a level of efficiency where like more efficiency means more computing power, which means more uh, carbon burned and we just we're already too far so I don't know I just I think that I'm I'm really into like speculating about like exciting and positive visions of the future but like that one to me just feels like so far-fetched that we need something that looks a lot more like degrowth than yeah. that no I I, I I I run into that a lot in my sort of like imagining of the good future which is like it's sort it's sort of like degrowth but then on the other hand, then like degrowth often feels like sort of a, a technical term for like, you know, wow, a lot of people are going to die, you know, like sort of wow, a lot of like, there's going to be a lot of like, just sort of like how much of like people's existence, how much of like society's existence is predicated on like, you know, sort of this unsustainable thing. And so like, you know, if, if there were degrowth, on like that sort of massive scale as sort of as like a result of sort of um socialist and that yeah like you know like as, as a result of like you know our agitating our like sort of creating a new a better future like how how do we protect like as many people as possible how do we like serve as many people as possible and it's also not a super like you know inspiring message right it's like well you know things are things are necessarily going to have to get worse but we all have to bear the burden because otherwise like you know society like climate change is going to wipe us out it sort of feels really like it's a challenge and like you can go to some really like dark places as an organizer when you really think about like oh shit like you know degrowth is probably the only viable solution for like you know us as a as a species um you know and sort of then it's like a managed degrowth is that like the best we can offer as as like sort of organizers of like this is the way forward a managed degrowth in which like everyone everyone's taken care of but like we probably can't have like you know 24 hour delivery of anything that you want at any given point like it's probably not possible like sorry y'all like you know you're, we're going to have to get behind this. I mean, I don't know. Fortunately, we're not really going to have to be the ones to break that news. Like, it's happening whether we have good messaging around it or not. Um, I think that your point about degrowth, meaning that people will die, I mean, uh, yeah, maybe. Like, any future that we have, like, is going to be a struggle. Things are going to continue to get harder. Um, but the thing is, the 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 way that we're going right now with regard to technology like we know that people will die because we know where those minerals are sourced from and we know that like that well first of all we're going to run out of them mm -hmm. um but second of all we, we we can see the impact of um continuing at the, the current on the current trajectory all the time um i don't think that i think that our propaganda around this is incredibly important as it is with anything and i, I think that you know, we don't have to be like, well, come join the socialists. It means you'll never get to order from Grubhub ever again. Um, you know, what we, we use the kind of positive messaging um, that we've been using, that we're 
building a community together that, you know, we're invested in each other's survival and each other's future. And the thing is like, um, I think one of the things that is radicalizing about this current time is that people are starting to recognize that a lot of the things that they are relying on are not going to exist anymore. Um, things are going to be more challenging and like, we are going to have less of what we used to have. And like, that's degrowth. Yeah. It's not, yeah. it's happening whether we like it or not. So we yeah. might as well get organized, you know? Yeah, no, it's almost like we position ourselves as like, well, this is hap like, you know, this was always going to happen. It's happening now. So like, let's all band together and like, you know, advocate for one another. And, um, you know, because I mean, and, and also your point to like um, the existence, like the sort of like rosy, com like comparatively rosy existence that people in the United States or like in sort of like advanced Western economies, whatever has, have um, enjoyed, has been at the sort of great expense of like people living in the global South right now. Um, or just like, I don't know if that term is still applicable or whatever. I'm, but like sort of, um, I don't know, I keep one of my favorite quotes is uh, um, from William Gibson, which is like, uh, shoot, of course not, like sort of the future is, um, fuck, I don't even remember the existence, but the the, the exact quote now, but like, um, you know, the future is exists in the present, just in like different places and different, like that's sort of like the- It's the not distributed evenly. Is, the, is not just I, I think I know the quote. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, the, the future is like, you know, just the present not distributed equally. Um, and so we're sort of starting to see that um, like some of the like, like the sort of illusion that like capital has created for like, you know, the, the Western consumer economies, which like are sort of like the ways, like one of the, like one of the, the points at which like, you know, it su can suck the most um, resources out of, all of a sudden those areas are starting to like, yeah, like you said, degrowth is actually currently happening. And so it kind of, at these moments where people are like, not used to like, you know, the, the degrowth that's happening as a result of, like we're seeing like, as a result of this current crisis with the uh, coronavirus, people who have been living in a world where they think that things are always going to get better are suddenly being rudely woken to the fact that no, things are going to start getting worse. And so um, what do we do about it? And like, it seems like a very compelling time to say, well, you know, join a socialist community, join a socialist organization, join like a world in which we can take care of each other and also agitate as a, as a mass for like a better future, I guess. Um, love to hear any other questions from some of the people who haven't spoken much. Um, that last one was really good, spurred some good discussion. Hi, this is Michael. I use they, them pronouns. Um, and I have had on my mind for a while on this call um, something, Allison, you brought up early on that um, Amazon Web Services hosts that is, is managing like a ridiculous chunk of servers. Um, and I had never, I mean, like, I know the internet doesn't exist in this like made up um, cloud that we all have access to. Like, you know, we can all just like walk into the forest, we can just walk into the internet. I know it's not like that, but oftentimes, it feels like that and I have to remember that like there are physical places where the internet is stored um, or like it runs out of, off of. Um, I'm wondering if there's any, like the realm of left technology is like totally, I don't know anything about it. So is there any sort of like ownership of server movement or like work being done um, or anything along those lines? I'm so glad you asked that because yeah, there is a, I mean, the, the free and open source software world, um, I wouldn't call it like exclusively left because there's a lot of people that come to it from different political perspectives. Like there's a lot of libertarians in there, unfortunately, but at least the guiding, 
the shared ethos is that like us as users, we should have control over our own technology. We should be able to modify it if we want to. We should be able to see what's going on in the inner workings. And even if we don't understand what those things do or what they are, we don't. We can't read a line of code. The point is that we should we should have this as like a right. Um, and so there is free and open source software, sometimes the more kind of political, politicized parts of it are called like liberation technology. And there are all kinds of people all over the world who are, um, who are building their own infrastructure, um, who are, you know, creating services for other people to some degree or another. Um, to your point about the servers, I mean, honestly, most of the people that I know who are from that world, um, they're running their own servers, like, you know, bare metal, co-located in some data center, right? They're, they're doing it as, they're, they're keeping it under their own control as much as possible. Um, there are some, like, cloud service providers that have something that's like, that's like AWS that I think are more, um, that they have better ethos, or at least they use free software, or they're smaller companies. You know, I run my servers on Linode, which is a pretty small company. They're actually in Philly. Um, so there, there are a lot of different options for it. You know, I mean, I think more of the, there's so many different ways that this comes up, right? I mean, servers are just one of them. Like, what about like, you know, the, the technology that we're in, like, what about video chat, right? Zoom is a giant company. All these terrible things came about about Zoom security practices and attention tracking and all sorts of stuff. Um, so there are alternatives that exist. Um, some of them work better than others. Some of them are more free, like more um, are like not using any of the sort of corporate or using the least amount of the sort of corporate infrastructure. And it really just depends on how resourced people are. Um, for example, like in Berlin, where there's a huge concentration of, of these kinds of hackers, like they have, um, municipal Wi-Fi and they have like it's it's fairly it's lower friction to like live that kind of life um but the thing is like we're talking about like going up against like some of the most powerful forces that exist and so for the most part it's like you know you're going to be running some software that like doesn't work as well um you're going to be like having to make more decisions as a user than what most people have the technical capacity for. Um, and it's super like individual and I do all, a lot of this stuff too, but it's like super like I'm, I have my own little private boycott kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's complicated, but I think there's a lot of really interesting worthwhile projects out there and the, the sense of community in them is really good. Um, and I think in the last few years, there has been more of a move for a lot of these projects to become more left. Um, so like I'm involved with the Tor project that makes Tor browser, which is an anonymity browser. And like in the last few years, like the people who volunteer on that project, there were always a lot of leftists, but like it just sort of, I think that the way that the world has been going, like there's a lot more people, a lot of the libertarians went somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Like I've, I've often sort of been on the fence with like sort of um, the like, increased use of like technologies that are like more like ethical essentially like you know versus like you know using the technologies that like exist to that are often like slightly easier to use because like on the one hand i've been part of like organizing projects that have basically just cratered because people were so obsessed with like using the sort of perfect like security culture technological backing like you know like systems that like nothing ever got done and so then it was, it's like that sort of but then on the other hand like a lot of the the ethos behind a lot of like you know the and not just ethos but like you know potentially practical benefits behind a lot of like sort of open source projects behind a lot of like you know sort of i don't know i get i it has is very like compelling and so i'm i'm like, I mean, I, I, I'm always sort of like, I usually fall on the side of like, let's just use Google Docs and let's just use like, you know, sort of whatever servers we can find. Let's just, because it's like, you know, they do a, you know, 
they they make it like like you said very low barrier to entry and so you know for a lot, like if you're trying to get a lot of people like organizers like who are already sort of struggling with like the the tools and like you know concepts of organizing on board you don't want to have that initial barrier to entry of like um you know oh and then also we all have to figure out how to use this like system which is like probably better in a lot of ways but is a little bit more difficult to use and i wonder if like you could talk Allison to like how do you feel like we like the left like people on the left in general should have to become like more technologically savvy in the future like do you think this is eventually something that as a culture like the left will probably have to do or do you think it it's something that like like how do you see that that working like you know sort of developing sort of technological savvy among like the left yeah, 100%. We suck yeah, at it. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I think one thing that we fail to recognize is how good our adversaries are at it. So the yeah, fascists, yeah. they know how to use computers. There's a lot of fucking hackers who are fascists. Yeah. A lot. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I since this is recorded and this is going on Facebook or whatever, like, I'm not going to say any more about this because that is how to make yourself a target of these people. But like, yeah. um, we like we are good at we're getting better i think at like doing all kinds of political education and recognizing that like our people can learn all sorts of stuff that like you know it's it's worthwhile to like to like go into like heavy concepts and like mm -hmm. this is part of our history and this is like we we do we should want to learn difficult things together and i think like learning how technology works needs to be a super big part of that because it's, it is involved in so many parts of our lives. Um, and I think that like, uh, we, if we better understood it, we could be, you know, I mean, talking again about like how, the difference between like trying to prefigure something. I mean, we could be building our own, um, infrastructures or at least having some more control over them because the thing is i hear you on the convenience thing and i make those decisions a lot all the time too but something that i think we need to keep in mind is um how it is even um subtly or like we don't even think about how it de-radicalizes us we don't have the kinds of conversations that we might have we're not doing the kind of militant work that we might do if it's on Google Docs. Frankly, we're just not, you know? Because people have an understanding of what, like, the relationship is with me and this, like, technology, and people self-censor all the time, you know? And I think, like, we also have to consider, like, who, who is getting left out because, like, there's a bunch of people that are getting included because of the convenience, but there's a lot of people who are also getting left out for it who cannot have a, a permanent record held by the most powerful corporations in the world and accessible by law enforcement, it permanently that they're a member of a socialist organization. You know, so, I mean, it's a hard thing to solve for. And like, part of it is yeah. having good security culture, but that's also flexible when it needs to be flexible, but it's, it's super challenging. And part of it is that we, we don't, we don't learn how to use our computers. That's the starting point, right? You know, most, I went to a, like a college prep high school that didn't have any CS classes at all. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think about a lot how like it's, I mean, I, 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 I was somewhat fortunate in that, like I grew up in like my, my dad is, was like really into like artificial intelligence and I grew up like in the nineties when the, the internet was, still somewhat like you know it was less corporatized than it is today and so i sort of have like a bit of a fundamental understanding but even i like you know i don't i i think that like i i know a bunch but sort of uh the people growing up with the internet today don't necessarily even have that they might like they because it's become this sort of like funneled through Facebook, funneled through like sort of larger corporations that funneled through Google, funneled, funneled through Facebook, funneled through Amazon, that like there isn't even, and it's, it is sort of like a, a tragedy that like there just isn't this baseline level of like, how do computers actually work? 
people only really know how do like the the user interfaces that have been created for me work, which is I think like you know something that the sort of like in the early days of the internet, a lot of the like technological visionaries were like, oh, the, you know, the future is gonna be filled with people who like understand technology, understand computers and what a world that will be when like people just grow up with this sort of baseline understanding of like, you know, how, do, how it works. But like, it turns out like, oh, this isn't what we want. Like this isn't what the, the systems of the world want. They want people to know how to use Facebook and Amazon and Google and kind of that's it. And it's, you know, I, I, I'm not really sure how to, I mean, the only way to solve that obviously is like, you know, well, you just gotta learn how to use it. And like, you know, that's like, you know, it's one of the things that I personally as sort of an organizer keep sort of pushing, push, putting off as like, you know, because it seems like there's so much else that I need to do, but it is, I don't know, that's sort of why I asked the question, because I was like, well, how really important is this? And I mean, I think, I think I kind of, you know, agree with you that, like, our adversaries, if you will, like, you know, the, the right, the far right is much more computer literate, probably as a result of, like, sort of the individualist philosophy of, like, you know, all I do, like, because we're out here in the community trying to, like, build connections with people, and that's how we spend our time. Whereas, like, that's not really, like, at least among, like, the sort of internet fascists, it's really a priority. A priority is, like, you know, much more individualist just because of the the philosophy that they follow. I, th I think, you know, what you, what you said, Marlon, about, like, the way that, like, the internet and computers in general has kind of become constrained is, like, another... Um, another example of one of those like capitalism constraining the possibility you know it's like the competition happens and these systems uh these companies rise up and use their power to like make things simpler and make things make people not have to worry about the back end or the thing that goes into it or put much thought into it and then that constrains what people think of the internet as being as being you know what the possibilities yeah. are especially like especially when you think about the sort of like techno utopianism of the like 80s and 90s of where people are like yeah. this is gonna revolutionize everything and like if we just get everyone on the internet then like these amazing things will happen and and right. uh, which i think is definitely a lot of like the root of the sort of libertarian mindedness in tech of like just that hope mm -hmm. that like everyone as individuals connected together will create the ultimate society which is it's not the whole yeah. picture you know and and yeah. as as people only see or come to only see the internet as as these tools like facebook or like gmail which are tools and they're useful in certain senses mm -hmm. but they don't they like constrain what what you can do on them for all the reasons that you both talked about um so i don't know I, I, you know now thinking about it more like i definitely was more on your like more of your point of view marlon of like the well we you know this is it'll be easier for new people or people who aren't involved in organizing to get involved with these things if there's a low barrier to entry like technology wise. But then I've come around more to uh, Allison, your point of view of like, well, we need to learn all these things and we should, and people do have the capacity to learn. I think that's one of the reasons why I'm a socialist, you know, is like, I believe the working class, like everyday people will have the capacity to learn how to run their lives and how to run the world, you know? And, and I think we shouldn't lose sight of that um, yeah, but yeah, definitely one of the problems is like the problem that you run into organizing just generally, which is just like, uh, time and energy is limited. And like, I would love to set up like a Philly socialist server to have, to run like internal communication software or like whatever, but it's just like, I don't think I have the capacity to do that as an individual. And it's just like, I don't know, it'd be cool to do that. <laughs> uh, good question, Michael. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there any other uh, questions that people want us to talk about? Um, got like maybe 15, 20 minutes left.
it's just one of the things I was thinking about is just like I remember like reading about like oh, no. during like the Russian Revolution, like people just like running down to the barracks and just like convincing everyone to like join this revolution. And I feel like you know, like in the years since it's become more and more difficult to even imagine something like that, just with like, increasing like militarization and increasing technology. Um, but I guess kind of circling back to like the the thing about like AI not working that well all the time is like I wonder if in some ways it creates opportunities for like leftist like hackers and technologists to think about ways that we can more effectively kind of throw wrenches in the gears and or like hijack things in some ways. Um, I don't know if it's a thought, I guess. Yeah, I mean, like the Luddites are our forebearers, right? Like we we should be claiming them a lot more than we are. They were labor organizers and they weren't anti-technology. They just recognized that automation was set up to fuck them over. And so they would destroy it. And they were, they had strong security culture. I mean, Ned Ludd was not a real person. He was an avatar for their organizing and they sent anonymous letters under his name and then they would, you know, fuck up the, the gears of the mills and all sorts of stuff, you know? And, um, I mean, they were ultimately not organized enough to not get crushed, but the important thing is that there's a, we have a tradition of this, right? We just have to do more of it. Hey, sorry, my, uh, my, the phone that I was using died, so I got to change to something else. Um, any other final questions, or maybe we could just throw it back to Allison and Marlon just to wrap up with some closing thoughts. Um, my closing thought is that everyone who, uh, is able to and willing to take their risk should go get a job. If, if they're not employed, you should go get a job at Amazon warehouses and get involved in the organizing efforts that are happening there. And I believe that Dignity is going to start thinking about this. I don't want to say too much, obviously, because we are recording, but, um, yeah, that's what you should do. No, yeah, this is this has been a really great. Uh, thank you for putting this together, Jake. Um, I'm like, I don't know, this is the kind of thing that I like thinking about. I love like just thinking and talking and chatting about like, you know, ideas about the future, like, you know, and, and yeah, no, I, I've, I've really enjoyed this. So thanks for putting it together. Um, yeah, thank you, Jake. Yeah. Um, happy, I think. I think this was a really interesting conversation and uh, I'd love to do more things like this. Uh, and yeah, thanks thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I'll upload this recording to our Facebook uh, so you can see it afterwards. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Get involved with Philly Socialists if you aren't already. So. Yeah, and uh, if you want to like, yeah, I'm going to do like the, the plug if you want to like read a draft or whatever of like, you know, work that I'm working on, you know, let me know like I'm always interested in sharing stuff that I'm doing. I'm, I'm like the world's worst like self promoter of like as myself as a writer, because I tend to be like, oh, look at this thing that I did without like thinking about like, how do I turn this into a product. But like, you know, sort of if, uh, if you're interested in reading anything I wrote just you know, send me and like a Facebook message or email. I don't know what here. I'll give my uh, 
my thing in the chat. Um, yeah, you know, just send email. Yeah, just email me if you're interested in my fiction, um, chatting more about socialist futures in general. And uh, yeah, it was great. Uh, one more thing is that one of the panelists who was supposed to be on this but had to drop out will be giving their talk, which is on space. Uh -huh. uh, oh, cool. On, yeah, on May 5th, because apparently there's a meteor shower. Uh, so they'll be pointing out stuff in the sky and also talking about the space industrial complex i guess i don't i don't know exactly but uh, keep cool. an eye out for that so yeah thanks everybody awesome yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks everyone thank you all